Um, and so I want to sort of walk you through the spreadsheet that you'll be using for that, that assignment. Um, well, this is, this is the most important screen. This, this uh, adjustment is, and this is volume fraction of organic modifier, and we're doing reverse phase chromatography. So when you increase the volume fraction of the organic component of the mobile phase, the other component is water, you make the mobile phase stronger and stronger until it's pure organic. And that, that, that corresponds to a volume fraction of one. Um, so if I change the slider position, I can actually bring all the peaks out in the dead volume and there's no resolution at all. Um, this window down here is actually a plot of the retention factors of all of the compounds in the mixture. And as you move the slider, you're actually moving along this axis. And so the retentions are moving along these different straight lines. Um, however, temperature also has an influence on retention. Generally, as you increase retention, I'm sure, as you increase temperature in reverse phase chromatography, uh, there's a decrease in retention. Um, and there's definitely an optimum temperature, and there's definitely an optimum mobile phase composition. And so the first job for you guys is to find the best separation of this five-component mixture. So if I, if I just get that out of the way, um, and I go to somewhat more reasonable conditions, I'll just arbitrarily go there. You see that there are actually at least four peaks, but there are five. I'm not going to show you what the answer is. Um, but you may want to adjust both the mobile phase composition and the temperature. That's the first part of the problem. And when we do reverse phase, you'll understand that a little better. It's, it's, it's just, it's, that's really not the central issue in this problem, in this assignment, though. choose to mix any of them together. Um, the mixture I picked is not the worst separation, not the hardest separation, but it's reasonably difficult. Um, but more importantly right now is you can, you can vary any of these boxes which are white. You can change the volume injected, the concentration injected, the time constant of the detector can offset the chromatogram up and down to give you a little bit better picture. Um, uh, the chromatogram assumes that there is some noise, which is why um, this is a little bit fuzzy. And if you look at the top of the peaks, they're a little bit fuzzy. Um, and the time constant certainly affects that noise. So you, you may want to play with the time constant to adjust the noise to get best results. Although if you, if you make the time constant too big, you're going to pay a price for that. 
as we discussed. Um, there's a, a volume. You can inject more sample or less sample. But if you inject too large of a volume of sample, you know what's going to happen. The peaks are going to get wider, and you're going you're to hurt the resolution. So that's one of the things I ask you to do is look at the effect of the volume. Um, you can change the flow rate. Uh, you could change the length of the column. You could change the diameter of the column. You could change the particle size. You can vary the normal things that you could vary in a, in a laboratory. You can change columns. You can go from one column length to another. You can't go from a five centimeter column to a six centimeter column because nobody sells a six centimeter column. But you can here if you want to see what's going on. Um, uh, you can theoretically you could put in a particle size here of uh, of, of uh, five point one one. You can't buy 5.11 diameter particles. You can buy fives and threes and 3.5s, but you know, we didn't make those discontinuous variables in this in this uh, program. And so the instructions tell you what to vary and what you should be observing. And basically, you're going to write a lab report as if you did this in lab. That's the assignment. Um, as I said, you, since it's in the, in the Google Drive, you can't change anything in the Google Drive. You can download it, but you can't change anything in there. Um, so if you, if you screw up this copy, you can go get another copy. And I, I mention this only because I've screwed it up a lot. Because I've changed something that was in yellow, which you're not allowed to change. Um, one other just minor point. I chose this diffusion coefficient. Uh, this is the diffusion coefficient of an average size uh, pharmaceutical molecule, something with a molecular weight of about, say, 300 to 400. We have this kind of diffusion coefficient at room temperature um, in, in an aqueous organic mobile phase. If, if, if you wanted to do a protein or something like that, you'd have to make that number a good bit smaller. But if you change that number, things are going to change. If you have any questions, just email me or come see me or whatever you want to do and I'll straighten it out for you. And I would get started now. Okay. Okay, so today we're, we're get, gonna start getting into the details of what are going on inside of the column. And the process of diffusion is terribly, terribly important in chromatography. So we're gonna take a good hard look at, at diffusion in, in general. And in my notes, I talk at length about the physical process of diffusion, why it happens, um, how to estimate diffusion coefficients and stuff like that. I'm not going to cover any of that in class, but nonetheless, you need to know those materials. I'm going to talk about the nitty gritty of, of the physical process of diffusion. Um, why? Well, because it's important in chromatography. That's why we're going to talk about diffusion. Um, diffusion is the origin of the B term in the Van Dienter in both liquid chromatography and gas chromatography. It is also the origin of slow mass transfer inside the stationary phase. Outside the stationary phase, other things happen, but inside the stationary phase, the only way we have to transport material is by diffusion. Um, and this, this holds for both the inside of LC particles and it holds of a GC capillary. 
Um, in capillary electrophoresis, diffusion, longitudinal diffusion is the principal broadening factor. If you're doing capillary electrophoresis properly, it's the only thing that's happening that broadens the peak. So clearly, you need to understand diffusion to understand capillary electrophoresis. So today, we're going to talk about diffusion from a plane source, uh, and it'll be a one-dimensional diffusion problem. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we're usually interested in diffusion in multiple dimensions. We're interested in diffusion in cylinders and in spheres, so we're, we'll have to address that. So we have to talk about diffusion in more than one dimension. Um, I'll, I'll then talk about diffusion in a sphere. Um, I'll show you the equation for diffusion in a cylinder, but we're actually going to have to work on the equations of diffusion in a sphere. And most importantly, we're going to calculate the time it takes to fill an empty sphere by diffusion from outside of the sphere. The reverse process of, of emptying the contents of a sphere by diffusion back out is, is the reverse process. So you really only have to understand one because the other is the flip side. It's, it's really just time is reversed, if you will, um, when you're emptying it. And then we'll talk about diffusion in a thin film, which is what happens, of course, in a, uh, a wall-coated open tubular GC column. So, to get started, uh, this, is, this is what we call fix first law of diffusion. And this J sub X, this is one dimensional diffusion. This is the, the, this is the flux of matter, which, which is the number of moles per second, or that's, that's the rate of diffusion, moles per second, per unit area through which diffusion is taking place. So for instance, if you were talking about a sphere, the outside area of the sphere, you would take, jet, you would take the moles per second and divide it by the outside area of the sphere. If it was a plane, then you would divide by the area of the plane. So the units of flux are moles per second, and then if we take area in square centimeters, it's moles per second per centimeter squared. And that's equal to minus, the minus is extremely important, the diffusion coefficient The, the diffusion coefficient is a property of the species, the molecule, the atom, the ion, that is diffusing. Depends on how big it is, but it also depends upon the medium in which the diffusion is taking place, primarily through the viscosity of that medium. And generally speaking, the more viscous the fluid is, the lower will be the diffusion coefficient, of a given molecule. If you change something like temperature, the diffusion coefficient will change. And this last term, dc dx, that's the derivative of concentration with respect to distance. So if my, my, dif if my concentration versus distance plot looked like this, so that the concentration was a constant. The derivative of the concentration with respect to distance, dc dx, is zero. There's no concentration difference, and the flux is zero. 
I mean, that's, that's all that Fick's law says, is that if you don't have a concentration gradient, there's no diffusion. But there's a minus sign. So what the minus sign says is that diffusion takes place from the high concentration towards the low concentration. So if my concentration versus distance looked like that, so the concentration was going down, then you would have to, the, the flux would be positive and the flux is in the direction of the of from low of, from high concentration to low concentration. So this, this, the material would then diffuse in that direction. That would be the positive flux direction minus d dc dx dc dx is negative minus a negative is a positive. So the flux is in the direction from high concentration to low concentration. That's what Fick's first law says. Fick's second law is a little more complicated. <clears throat> it says that the time rate of change, dc dt, of concentration is equal to d, the diffusion coefficient, times the second derivative, not the first, the second derivative of the concentration with respect to distance. Now, if you work out the units, um, the units of d are dc dt over second, second derivative of c with respect to x, the units of D work out to be length squared per unit time, or centimeter squared per second, as I said the other day. It is absolutely essential that you know the units of the diffusion coefficient. If you don't know them, you won't get the right answer. Now, this equation is also interesting in that it says if my concentration versus distance is a straight line, the second derivative of that with respect to distance is zero. So there's really no net movement of solutes unless you have a nonlinear as a function of distance concentration gradient. You have to have curvature in that in order for dc dt to be other than zero. It's also a very important thing to, under, thing to understand. Okay, now what we're going to talk about now is, is we're going to apply fixed second law to the, to the simplest possible diffusion problem. So here's concentration, here's distance. I'm gonna, I'm gonna locate my source, the source of my material that's gonna diffuse at x equals zero. And at, at zero time, I'm gonna load into my system an, ex, an, an impulse of, of solute. And I'm going to load it in. All of my solute is going to be at x equals zero. <coughs> and I'm going to allow diffusion to happen in, in both the positive and negative x direction. So I am the initial pulse. I know, I know I'm not narrow. Uh, but I'm the initial pulse of solute, and I'm going to allow the molecules to diffuse in both directions. That, that is the boundary condition that I'm choosing to use. There could be an impenetrable wall on one side of me, in which case, if I attempted to diffuse into the wall, I would simply bounce off of the wall. That's a different problem than what I'm solving. I'm allowing diffusion to happen in both directions. 
the, the final boundary condition is that I'm going to allow diffusion to take place until infinite distance on both sides. I'm not going to have a wall anywhere. So this, this in principle extends out to plus and minus infinity. So my, my initial condition, my IC, so-called initial condition, is that C at any x at zero time is, is equal to, well, it's equal to the strength of the impulse of sample times the direct delta function of x. The delta function is an impulse. It's It's an infinitely narrow pulse of sample at, at x equals 0 I'm also going to put in the boundary condition that at plus and minus infinity at any time okay so I'm not, I don't have any walls anywhere but the concentration an infinite distance away from the source of the material has to be zero. You can't get to an infinite distance ever. So that has to be zero. So these are the conditions under which I'm solving the problem. And so the solution to the problem has to simultaneously do two things. It has to be a solution of this differential equation and it has to obey the initial condition and the, and the boundary conditions. If it doesn't, it's not a solution. Problems like this are frequently simply called boundary condition problems. Yeah. Let me go to the next slide. I think I've got it all the time. Yeah. I didn't mean to write where I had that equation. I'm going to have to write the equation for you. This equation is a solution of the differential equation. You can prove that. I'm not going to show you, but you can prove it easily by taking it, taking the equation, and taking the first time derivative. Then take the same equation and take the second x derivative, multiply the second x derivative by d, and you'll see that, in fact, the first time derivative is equal to d times the second distance derivative. So this, this is a solution of that. And then if you ask it, what are, what's the values at, the inf at infinite distances, it's going to tell you zero. And if you ask what's the value initially, it's going to tell you the initial condition. So this is the general solution of this problem with these boundary conditions. With these boundary conditions. Now if you look at this equation, you can see that it's a Gaussian function of x. It's exponential minus x squared. That's the characteristic of a Gaussian function. And Gaussian functions are, you know, exponential minus x squared over 2 sigma squared. That's the way we write Gaussian equations. So the denominator here, 4 dt, is 2 sigma x squared. So sigma x squared is 2 dt. So this is the variance of the distribution. And it says that the variance increases linearly with time. So the sigma, which is the square root of the variance, increases with the square root of time. This is exceedingly important. This tells you how far 
the molecule can get from its source in a given time. It, it's actually talking about the behavior of an average molecule because as you know, diffusion is a random process. And some of the molecules won't ever get anywhere, won't get away from the source at all. They may diffuse for a while, but they can reverse direction and they can go back to home. So this is the, this is the average, it's actually called the root mean square average of the distance that a molecule can diffuse by diffusion. What does it look like? That's the more interesting thing. So I'm going to plot that function as a function of distance from the source, so the plane at zero, at different times. So there's that one second. Um, this is for a diffusion coefficient of 0.1 centimeter squared per second. This is a typical diffusion coefficient of a small molecule say a molecular weight 100, like benzene, in a gas uh, at, say, 50 degrees centigrade at roughly one atmosphere pressure. It's a typical GC diffusion coefficient. So what it's saying is in one second, the molecule can get, meh, on average, a little bit less than one centimeter from it from its starting point. Now a liquid diffusion coefficient is typically four orders of magnitude smaller or less or more smaller than that. So you can see that in one second a molecule in the liquid phase doesn't get very far at all. S sigma is square root of 2 dt. So if you made d four orders of magnitude smaller the, the sigma would be two orders of magnitude smaller. So on the order of a millimeter would be what you'd see in a liquid rather than on the order of a centimeter. <clears throat> now if we give it more time, the average molecule can get a little bit further, but it only increases with the square root of the time so the width of the red distribution is only the square root of three bigger than the, the, the one second distribution. It's not three times further, it's only the square root of three, which is about 1.73. And if we go up to 10 seconds, the distribution looks like that. The areas are all the same because diffusion doesn't destroy matter. So this is, this is the solution to the problem of diffusion from a plane where the boundaries are, there are no boundaries, they're infinitely far away. If, if we had boundaries, it wouldn't look quite like this because some molecules would get out to the boundary and then they'd bounce off of it and start to come back. So that's one dimensional diffusion from a plane. <clears throat> this is the, the general equation for, for diffusion in three dimensions. Um, when I lost two students before class, and now I lose another student. Uh, uh, two, two of you guys have flu, and one was hospitalized. So I hope, I hope you weren't sitting too close to them the other day. Um, okay, and this is a special case of diffusion in three dimensions because the D, I'm using the same D at e, in each direction. This is what's called isotropic diffusion. There are fluids where diffusion is not isotropic. For instance, a liquid crystalline phase, the diffusion, depending upon the type of liquid crystal, diffusion in a, the diffusion coefficient could be different in all three directions. But this, we don't get into that sort of situation. Physicists might and people doing transistor work might, but chromatographers don't use very many liquid crystalline 
Okay, so this is the, this is general diffusion in three dimensions, but there are two specific cases that are more interesting, and that's diffusion in a cylinder, and when you impose cylindrical sy cylindrical symmetry on things, the the three dimensional problem really boils down to a radial diffusion issue, and for a cylinder, this is the this is the equation for diffusion in a cylinder. And more interestingly, we frequently use spherical particles a lot. And so this is the equation for diffusion inside of a sphere. So now we have to solve one or the other of these subject to the appropriate boundary conditions. Well, filling an initially empty sphere is a really important diffusion problem because your solute in the, in the chromatography column is going to arrive at the outside surface of a spherical particle and then it's going to have to diffuse in and then as the peak gets flushed past, past downstream of that particle the stuff is going to have to diffuse back out so filling and emptying a sphere is an important problem for us We're going to take, we're going to make the problem simple by assuming that the concentration of the stuff, that's supposed to be a sphere. That's the radius of the sphere is R naught. We're assuming that the concentration of the stuff right outside the sphere, at the, at the periphery of the sphere, is C naught. And at time zero, and, and there's an infinite supply of this stuff, C naught. So somehow we maintain C naught at that radius of the sphere. And then this stuff is going to diffuse into the sphere from all directions, having the same diffusion coefficient. The, the gradient of the concentration at the center of the sphere has to be zero because it's symmetric. And so you've got diffusion from both directions or back out from both directions, and it's perfectly symmetrical. So there's no gradient right at the center of the sphere. That's R equals zero. And this, the solution to this problem, there's a number of ways you can solve this problem, but um, the, the Fourier method is, is actually the simplest. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this, you'll have to trust me, but you could take this equation and plug it in there, and you would see that it does in fact satisfy that equation, and it satisfies that equation, and it satisfies that equation. So in, in order to get the concentration as a function of distance and time, <clears throat> uh, there's a slight, just teeny tiny algebraic problem. You have to do this sum from n equals 1 to n equals infinity. Now my spreadsheet's not big enough to do that. Okay, so I, I, I had to truncate my spreadsheet at about 30, n equals 30. So the, you're going to see some, the fits don't look beautiful. But they would if I took an infinite number of terms. So here's, here's the, the result. Um, this is the center of the sphere, and this is the radius of the sphere. This is R naught. I've dimensioned, I've undimensioned it by plotting r, little r, the radius over the actual radius. I guess I call that r naught of the sphere. Okay, and the stuff is coming in from the outside. So the outside would be over here. So if we started, at, if, if I said dt over r squared t equals zero, there would be nothing inside. It would be zero, 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 zero. It would hit the radius of the sphere would go up vertically and then it would be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. 
Okay, that's hard to draw. So I took a short time. And so here's dt over r squared equal 0.01. And you can see the little deviation from 1 there. And that would go away if I took n equal to infinity and had a big, big spreadsheet. And then the concentration goes down until there's virtually nothing. I mean, there, these are finite numbers, but they're so small you can't see them on the plot. If, if I allow it more time and set dt over r squared equal to 0.02, looks like that. More stuff is diffused in. It hasn't had enough time yet to really build up very much stuff at the center of the sphere. In other words, it takes a while for the stuff to get all the way into the particle. At last, at point o, dt over r squared equal 0 0.05, there's some beginning to build up in the center of the particle. There's point 0.1 and then point 0.2. And you see it's going to take a fair while. And, and you would get to perfect e equilibrium when the concentration inside the particle is, is over a C naught is 1 from the center of the particle all the way to the outside of the particle. That's going to take infinite time to happen, to be exactly 1. Here's a plot of the concentration at the center of the initially empty sphere versus dt over r squared. And you can see it stays quite low. It stays quite low for an appreciable time. Then it comes up and then gradually rolls over and ultimately way out there it would, it would become exactly 1, but that would be at dt over r squared equal to infinity. Now, who, we don't care about perfect behavior. Here's, here's a different plot. This is the total number of moles of solute that enter the sphere as, again, of a function of dt over r squared. You get this by integrating the concentration over at all points of, from r equals 0 to r equals r naught inside the sphere. And you can see it starts low, and it comes up and it approaches 1. And I would say that about, about here, that's awfully close to 1. OK? Here is the important point. dt over r squared equals 0 0.5 is essentially your condition of equilibrium. Or, T equals 0.5 R squared over D. That's a super important equation. It clearly tells you that as you make the particle bigger, the time needed to fill the sphere goes up with the square of the radius of the particle. If you double the radius, it takes four times longer to fill the particle. Four times. And it's inversely related to the diffusion coefficient. So the lower the diffusion coefficient is, the longer it takes to fill the particle. So if we're talking about gases going into spheres, they go in a lot faster than liquids go into spheres. We're talking big spheres and little spheres. There's a dramatic difference with the size because it's a square dependence on the size. You must, you must grasp this. If you don't, you don't understand diffusion. You're going to make big mistakes, not little mistakes. Okay? Let's, uh, let's knock off for today. Didn't quite get there.